So my name is Stan Endersby, and I'm one of the Endersby boys. Uh, my father uh, came from England, and he was a Bernardo's child, and ended up coming to Canada, to Pickering, Ontario. And when he was 17, he lied about his age, and he joined the RAF, and he fought in the First World War. And near the end, he flew in the First World War, he was RAF. So near the end of the First World War, he taught people how to fly. And he taught a gentleman called Vernon Castle. And Irene and Ver Vernon Castle were the Fred Astaire of Ginger Roger of their day. And my father taught him how to fly, and they taught him how to dance. So at the end of the war, my father arrived in London, got on the dance floor, and started winning all these ballroom championships and things like this. So he became a dancer. Well, he came to Canada, first Montreal, and after the war with my mum, who was the first uh, female veterinarian in Paris, France. She went to school with 500 men. And uh, after the war, they went back to where her vet hospital was that she had, and the Germans had used it in target practice, and it was really pretty destroyed. So they decided to come to Canada. And my father had a radio show on CBC called Shall We Dance? about his dancing career. And we would all go down to the radio building when we were four or five years old. And I'd get on his knee and say, I want to hear Hound Dog by Elvis. And he'd play Hound Dog by Elvis. And my brother Ralph would be on the show. And we'd go through the radio building. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And then my father thought, well, wait a minute. They need children actors. Um, but he didn't want to, he couldn't afford to send five kids to an acting school, so he started his own acting school, Paul Endersby School of Drama. And a lot of actors went through that school, and it was a lot of fun, and we learned how to, to do lots of different things, and we started getting TV commercials. I'd be the kid jumping out of the back of a station wagon for Ch Chevrolet or something like that, and then I got roles on uh, Wayne and Schuster, the Jackie Ray Show, Cross Canada Hip Parade. And uh, that's where one of the stories comes in, Cross Canada Hip Parade. It was Joyce Hond and Wally Costers were the stars and it started Cross Canada Hip Parade. And in 57, I was on the show and songs like uh, 16 Tons was on the show and uh, bubble bangles and beads or something like that and yabba dabba dabba said the monkey to the chimp now there was this dancer who was new to cbc and uh, his name was andy Bodie, and he was very he was like the tommy toon of toronto uh, and very good looking guy and a very good dancer well i was my song was with Wally Coster was singing Love Me Tender because it was on the charts and with his wife and I'm this little eight-year-old, seven-year-old kid in the back eating beans on, you know, and that was what I did on that show. But Yabba Dabba said the monkey to the chimp. After they were finished singing it, Andy Bodie was to fly across the stage on a rope and get on a platform and then they'd put a chimpanzee on his arm and they'd do the Tarzan thing. Well, in the either the rough dress or the dress rehearsal, the chimp bit him. So they had to do some, they had to rush him to the hospital to get a tetanus shot and everything because they were all worried. So sure enough, they take him to the hospital. He walks in, he's got his Tarzan outfit on and the person at the desk says, what happened to you? You get bitten by a chimp? And he goes, yes. <laughs> so 35, 40 years go by and I'm at an antique store and I'm ready. To, I'm picking something up that I bought there. And in the corner, I see Andy Bodie. This is like 40 years later. And he was friends with the woman who owned the antique store. And I, beside him, I went, yabba dabba said the monkey to, and he just, just couldn't believe that, you know, uh, but that was just a real crazy story because that was live television. You know, it was very anti live television. You you had to be on time, 
And maybe that's why still today, if I have to do something, I'm there an hour earlier, that if my car broke down, I could still get there. I mean, firemen have that, you know, they have to be at the fire department at that time. It's the same thing with live TV. And you would get, I would go down to do a show and I would have a blue dress shirt because you couldn't black and white, you couldn't have white, you had to have a blue shirt. And had a lot of fun doing a lot of different shows. There were a lot of kid actors. There was like Michelle Finney, Peter Kastner, Rex Hagen, uh, uh, Trudy Young, uh, Tony Brown. Uh, uh, there was the Barringers. There was a whole slew of Barringer kids. Now, all my different brothers, we all acted and went on. Uh, Clive went to England with my brother Eric and Eric was in Lolita, and he changed his name to Eric Lane for that film. And my brother Clive was in all, he was in the original Bye Bye Birdie on the London stage. And my brother Ralph uh, was one of the stars in The Forest Rangers. He was Chubb Stanley. He was in 104 episodes. And we did shows like Cannonball. I was on Cannonball. There was a bomb in his truck and my brother and I are in the back of the truck finding this bomb. And I always had music in me. I, I became a musician, 60 years of playing music. But going down and seeing, working with the, the actors, you know, Barry Morse, uh, all the, the amazing actors, uh, Barbara Chilcott, all people like that, uh, Kate Reed. I watch all these people work and being an eight, seven year old kid, you know, the story. And that's why I think it helped me with my songwriting because I saw the story and I saw, you know, I saw the, the characters take place and then the costumes would happen and, and all that. So you get the more of the detail. So I think it really probably helped me with my songwriting, all that, doing all that sort of stuff. But uh, my brother Ralph, there's a story that was, there was a book that came out, I can't remember the name of it, on stories from actors talking. And it was a wonderful book, just cracks you right up. And in there, there's the story about my brother Ralph doing, it was a movie called Homer. And I think George McGowan was the director of it. And uh, it was a kid's coming of age. Uh, Vietnam War was there and they were all young kids. And uh, Tisa Farrow was in it, Trudy Young was in it. Um, a, a lot of the, the Canadian kid actors were in it. And uh, they were on set one day and they were on location at a farm and there was this barn and there was this cat and the cat had kittens so tisa farrow and trudy they're playing with the cat and they're patting it and they're putting it on their shoulders and on their heads and later that day they found out that the one of the cats got diagnosed with rabies so they asked the girls, uh, hey, were you playing with any of those kittens in the barn? And no, 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 we weren't, we weren't, we weren't. And either the cameraman or something like that or somebody on the crew said they were playing with the kittens, you know. So they had to go and get these very painful shots, very, very painful, and to get them really quick. Well, here's the predicament. My brother has this scene with Trudy Young where they're gonna kiss. So my brother has to phone the dog, go, listen, I might have to kiss a girl who's got rabies. <laughs> you know, uh, what's the chance of me getting rabies? And the doctor says, well, um, first off, what kind of kiss is it? He says, well, what do you mean? Well, is saliva gonna be passed, you know? And he says, well, I don't know how passionate the director wants me to, to kiss Trudy, I won't know till tomorrow. He says, well, you're okay. There's, an, there's a time period where you're all right, so you're gonna be all right. But that's, you know, my brother, like it's a dangerous business show business. It's very dangerous, you know? So uh, Elvis was really important to me. I really, Elvis really changed my life. That got me into music. Now my father played guitar and I had a slide bar and he, I would play with my dad. Sometimes we'd play music and I wasn't very good at that time.
But um, later on, I went through the Yorkville scene. I played in the Yorkville uh, music scene. And then everybody else went down to uh, the States to play. But the Vietnam War was on, and my brother Clive was in London. So I thought I'd check out the music scene in London before I and do LA a little bit later. So I go to England. I'm there. I see my brother Clive. I haven't seen him for six, seven years. I visit, I see him and I go back to his place. And I've been in England, you know, four hours. And I say, okay, I'm going to go check out the music scene in London. And he goes, Stan, it's 12 o'clock. Everything's shut down. I said, no, it's Saturday night. You know, he was a little bit different than, he wasn't a rock and roller in that sense of the word. So I go down to London, get down to Piccadilly, and I figured I'll go to Piccadilly Circus. That's pretty central and see what happens. I get out of the tube and, or I took a taxi, I can't remember. But I'm walking around, I hear this noise and this music. So I follow it and there's this big, huge building with silver everywhere and all these girls dancing in silver uh, go-go outfits. And as I'm looking up at all this, this guy goes, where are you from in the States? And I said, pardon me, I'm not from the States, I'm from Canada. He goes, oh, I'm really sorry, I thought you were American. My name's Hugh O'Donnell, I own this club, I've got to buy you a drink. So I said, okay, so I go into the club, I, he puts me in this VIP section, I sit down and he brings me a Bacardi and Coke, and I look up and I see a band setting up, and I, and I say, does anybody ever sit in with the bands? He says, you're a musician? No, I got hair down to here, I got a striped jacket, looks like a long chair, I got, you know, beads, I got a fringe jacket. Uh, I say, yeah, and he goes, to the band, let this guy sit in. So I go up and I play a tune. I'm five hours in London now. I get off the stage. This one kid comes and says, I want your autograph. I said, why do you want my autograph? Well, you're going to be a big star. I said, oh, really? Okay. So I give him my autograph. And then this guy comes, were you in a band called The Trip in Toronto? I said, yeah, we just did the pilot for the Sunday show that replaced this hour of seven days. Our band was featured in that first episode of it, the pilot in the first episode. He goes, yeah, my name's Lauren Michaels. I saw, I, I said, really? Oh, I said, hi. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I think I'm going to check out the music scene, see if I can get in the band. He goes, you're not going to have any trouble getting in the band. And then right after he says that, this guy goes, Hi, my name's Bill Fowler, and I'm from the Arthur Howes Agency, and we booked the Beatles on their first tour, and Peter Quaife of the Kinks would like to speak with you. So, I, English Invasion, Stones, Beatles, Kinks, six hours in London. I'm going, okay. So I go and I meet Peter, and I meet this manager person, and we talk, and the next day I go to his house, and he's unhappy with the Kinks, and he wants to leave the Kinks and he wants to start a band with me. Well, I say, okay, I'm going back to do this show for Jim Henson, and then if you want me after, he had one more, one more album he had to do with the Kinks. So after that, he phones me up and I go over and we start a band together and play in Copenhagen all over Europe, and we played the London Palladium. And one of the most amazing things playing the Palladium was we had this beautiful dressing room and it was just gorgeous. And there was a note from the woman whose dressing room it was and a bottle of wine saying, have a great show. And, you know, and I took that note and I still have it today. I, want, I should look up that actress and find out who the heck she is because uh, it was really special to play the Palladium. And we did an album for Decca and toured and we had a lot of great experiences. Uh, we one time we were, uh, Peter phoned up and said, there's this American guy and he's playing at the marquee. If you want to, you guys can go down and hear him and we'll send Jeff around with one of the vehicles. He wants to go to Stonehenge. Okay, so we go down to the marquee and there's this guy and he's going, things go better with Coca-Cola. Things go better with Coke. 
and the guy's just amazing. And he does fire and rain, and he does, you know, and James Taylor. So we get in our van, we go out to, you know, we're out there and there's no fences around and we're just having the most amazing time. And at 4.30 in the morning, some guy from Stonehenge comes, kicks us out of there. He says, you guys got to go. You got to leave now. So we left. But there was always things like that happening in London, like amazing, amazing things. And the thing I noticed the other day was, I was looking at this article in the English magazine from that time, and it's got a big article of us, and uh, there we are, you know, arriving in Peter's new band, and we're big in the paper. And underneath that article, there's this little tiny paragraph, <clears throat> and it goes, there's this guy making a name for himself at the Revolution Club, and it's his birthday. You should check him out. His name's Elton John. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I had such a great time in London. And the, to com the, what's amazing about this story is this October, I went back to London for the first time in 50 years. And there was a writer who wrote a lot of articles on me from my times in England, and I stayed with him and his wife. And I said, let's go to the pub where I, I met them and drank with them. And we go to the first one, and it's now in a restaurant, but in the back they've got a whole thing dedicated to the kinks. And it was Peter Quaife who I played with in the band, and it was called Maple Oak. And so we hung out there and had dinner. And then I said, let's go to the other pub. So we go to the other pub, we sit down, and there's a window, and literally two minutes later, the drummer from the Kinks goes by the window and comes into the club. And I went, hi, how are you doing now? I was a little too, whoa, this is weird. So he said he just got off the plane from the States, so I, I, back, I realized I was too, so I backed off, and I, and I just said, okay, great to see you. You know, didn't say anything, so I sat back down and said, Something weird's going on, you know. So I say to my, ask the people at the bar what's going on. So he goes, he asks them, they come back and says, there's a private party going on tonight for the Kinks. They've got a new release of a box set of the album that was, the, the picture of that pub was the cover of the album. And I'm looking, there's things on the table, coasters with the Kinks on the table. And I go, this is strange. So it's around back. So this pub was a big pub. They've cut it down and they've made places where you can have people, a party, a private party, or a function. So we go around the building to the back. I walk in, you know, I've got my fringe jacket on, and I, and I walk in, and this guy comes up and says, you guys aren't on the guest list. I said, no, I used to play with Peter Quaif in the 60s here in London. Hold on a second. He goes away, he comes back with some chips, or well, some like, uh, poker chip type thing and he said these are for drinks and here's this and you have a great time so I say okay and so there's three reporters talking they're videotaping everything this whole party's going on and then I see John Dalton and he's the one that replaced that got Peter's job when Peter left the Kings and I said hey, I used to play a maple oak he was actually all a little too excited about it but you know, we sat, and then I got my picture taken with him, you know, and it was very strange. And then the reporter guys, they asked me who I played with. I told them I played with Rick James, and I played with Brian McLean. And love, the group love, is so loved in England. And I played with Brian McLean in California, and he was very intrigued with that. But the thing that blew their mind was, how did I get there? How did I have no idea this was going to happen, that this party was going on? I think it was put off two times, apparently. And it was just how it is, you know. And I don't think things, just like my first experience, you know, it took about an hour and a half longer the second time to run into a kink. But <laughs> it still was a fascinating story. One of the fun things you did, I mean, I'm sure Basil's restaurant above that, you went and you signed your contract, and then you went to 
your fitting, your wardrobe and stuff like that, but you rehearsed at Sumac Street. Well, I go down to Sumac is where we did the rehearsals uh, for the show and uh, I'd get into the elevator and there'd be Red Shea with his tweed amplifier and his guitar going up to work. Music Hoff would be on and uh, we would go and do whatever we were doing in, in the rehearsal and but they'd sometimes say us because we were kids we were all very responsible all the the kids from that time and uh they would say to us listen you know, we're in the first act now you guys have half an hour you guys can leave and come back in half an hour so we'd either go to the they had a machines there to get chocolate bars in a lounge green room area or we could go between studio seven and studio four and we could go to the get a honey bun or a quiz, you know, down in the restaurant. And we would have a, a, a lot of, I would go, okay, now I can hear music. So I'd hear music coming out of one door and I'd open the door and there would be Red Shea and, and they'd be putting the needle down learning Roll Over Beethoven by the Beatles, you know, and our band played that song, you know, and then I'd go and I'd Holiday Ranch, there was Holiday Ranch and Country Hoedown. And I used to sit and watch Gordon Lightfoot dance on Country Hoedown, and he says he was a lousy dancer, but I don't think he was that bad. It looked like everybody knew what they were doing, you know, and I'd go and watch a lot of the dancers, and I'd watch uh, different people, you know, do their stuff, and it was so much fun. It was, it was really a treat to do that, you know, to have all, and then you go back and do what you were doing. And, uh, it was a, a fascinating time. Later on, I did one shoot later, one show later on, and they had it outside. And uh, I was playing a hood and I had to beat up this old man and I'm all in leather jackets and stuff. And the kids all in the, hey man, you're a meanie, you're a bad guy. And I thought, oh, no, no, we're acting here. Look, he's totally fine. He's not hurt at all, you know, but it was, it was uh, just the things that happened, you know, live TV, a, a lot of things would happen. So the Crest Theater, and here I now, I'm at PAL, and there's the Crest Theater Lounge, and uh, I, I love doing the show at the Crest. It was called The King of the Hearts. Um, Austin Willis, Barbara Chilcott, Rex Hagen, and me. And uh, we were held over three weeks, and, uh, it was, I remember we'd have to go, we'd have to put our own makeup on. We have, we get like this pancake makeup and have to put it on before we went on. And it was a, a great experience doing that show. Another thing that would happen because of my music thing, I got this one, we did, I did a lot of commercials for different products as a kid growing up. And I got this one job where it was for the newspaper, probably the Globe and Mail, because it was early in the morning. So they would pick me up at 6.30, take me out to the set, and they'd say, okay, what we want you to do is get on this bike, you pull up to this house, you stop, they had a mark for me to stop on, and you throw a paper on the porch, get on your bike, and you drive off. So it was an ad for the newspaper, early morning service type thing like that. So, okay. So I do that. Then we figure out we got to fold the papers up like newspaper guys do. They fold it over three times and tuck it in. So one of the people on the shoot knew how to do that. So we were doing that, putting them in the bag. And they opened the first one up, and the front page is Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and the big bopper guy in a plane crash. And so to this day... <laughs> You know, I know exactly what day that thing was because of that. And that was really big to us rock and rollers. And another time, I was doing this other on location at this old sort of bar, a really old style bar. And apparently when we got there in the car, they were talking how there was a fight in the bar on the weekend and there's a bit of a mess. They're gonna have to clean it up before it starts. Uh, shooting before you start doing something. So we're sitting around and they're cleaning up this mess and it's a jukebox with 78s in it 
and there's all these records on the ground. And I'm looking at them, and I'm picking one up, and it's B. Bapalula, Jean Vincent. I go, and they say, oh, you can have as many as you want. We're going to throw them all away. And I said, okay, but I didn't want to take too many, but I got Jean Vincent's. I got some Elvis ones. And, you know, so you, how would you think that would happen, you know? But uh, on the Wayne Schuster show, uh, it was, I did it a few times, Wayne and Schuster, maybe three times, a lot of Christmas specials. I guess they'd have more kids around Christmas time. But this one was, Elvis was pretty big, it was probably 58 or 59. And the scene was elves, at Santa's elves. And there was a guy being Elvis, and I was the bass player in the band, you know, the bass player. Well, I'm seven years old, and this double bass is like, it's like a tree, you know, I can already hold it. So I'm trying my best, and I don't know if it was, I don't think it was the show, but they had us, oh, we had beards, and, you know, we're like, we're these elves, you know, Santa's elves playing this rock and roll. And on either the rough dress or the dress rehearsal, I lost control of the bass and it went bam on the ground and one of them cracked a joke about it and I pick it up you know <laughs> and then for the show I was holding on to that bass with my life it was not gonna fall yeah so when I was a little kid I had a little autograph book and I'd get different people's autographs you know and uh I got a lot of different people, Frank Schuster, Johnny Wayne, you know, everybody, Cliff McKay, Holiday Ranch, uh, well, tons and tons of different actors and things like that. And uh, Dick Sean and all this, and I had them all in my autograph book. Well, one day I'm working in one show and I hear the Lone Ranger is coming in the other show, in the other part of the other studio. So I'm in the hallway between the two and I'm waiting for the Lone Ranger. I want his autograph, you know? I'm finished my bit, I'm okay, I'm hanging in there. And some people go by, some people go by. And the guy goes in the washroom, you know? And people go by and I go, hmm, where's the Lone Ranger? You know? Could that have been the Lone Ranger that went into the washroom? I said, well, I'm not going to walk into that. So I wait, and I wait, and a guy comes out of the washroom, goes away, another guy comes out. So I go in, and there's nobody there. So I miss the Lone Ranger. Well, my brother Clive just so happened to be doing a show the next day. Sometimes at the credits, it would be Paul Endersby, Clive Endersby, Eric Endersby, Ralph Endersby, Stan, all in the credits. It was ridiculous, you know? So Clive was there the next day doing a show, and he got the Lone Ranger's autograph for me. So in my book, there's one that is taped in, and that's the Lone Ranger's autograph. So I never really saw him, but my brother Clive did. Are you silver? Away!